The Tibetans believe that if their dog has a spot above the eye, that it gives them four eyes too. So not only does it make them look like they're awake, but it also helps to protect them from any demons. Hi, this is Anita from the Dusty Roads podcast, which is all about living life as a global citizen. I have always loved dogs, and I've had over five Tibetan Spaniels, or what many people call Tibbies. So I've always been really fascinated about this great story between Tibetan dogs and the Buddhist monasteries. Now, I must say that if any of you have a chance to go to Tibet, it is a magical place. Many years ago, well, not so many years ago, but it was a few years ago, I went with one of my Chinese staff to go on a charity trip. And we went to Chengdu, and then we literally drove 18 hours into Tibet on these dirt roads in an old army jeep that had no shocks, no seatbelt, and the door kept flying open. Tibet is really a magical place. And a lot of the places we went to are places that most people never go to. Our friend Jack, who was a tour guide, was also someone who bred Tibetan dogs. And he had taken in several European dog breeders into this part of Tibet for them to go and to look at or to try to find some Tibetan dogs. This is such a fascinating story because it's kind of a story that a lot of people don't know about, but it really shows how ancient a place is like Tibet. For over a thousand years, Tibetan dogs have been an essential part of the Tibetan Buddhist monasteries. And you know, the Tibetan monasteries have always had different dogs that had different types of roles. And first, I'm going to talk about the first kind of Tibetan dog, which is actually my favorite because I've had quite a few Tibetan Spaniels. I don't presently own one, but at one time I was actually breeding them in China. Tibetan Spaniels are also known as Tibbies and that they lived in the Tibetan mountains with the Tibetan Buddhist monks. You know, this is kind of a small breed of a dog. And in Tibetan, it's kind of known as a house dog, a room dog, or even a bedroom dog. They were considered an essential part of the Tibetan monasteries. But like some of the other Tibetan dogs, the Tibetan Spaniels were able to roam free throughout the monasteries. They were, you know, usually um, only for thousands of years. You could only get them either through a, um, a monk giving them to you, or it was so it was usually owned by Tibetans aristocratic classes, or by the Buddhist monasteries. These are very small dogs, and they were the dogs that sort of hung around as companions to the monks. So that also means that when you have a Tibetan uh, spaniel dog, that they're also extremely loyal. They'll be very, very loyal towards their family. You know, there's stories have told of these small Tibetan dogs that are sitting next to the uh, Tibetan lamas, and they'll sit on their laps, and they'll um, you know, while the, the llamas are chanting or they're meditating or praying, that these dogs will just sit there and they'll want to be right next to their um, to their owners. That means that they're an extremely loyal breed of a dog. And it also means that they were allowed to roam around freely. The thing about owning a Tibetan Spaniel is they will be extremely loyal towards their family. But if they feel like an intruder's coming in, They'll be fierce. That's why sometimes they call them a little lion dog because they'll bark and and they'll be very fierce towards here's somebody coming in to evade my space. So it means that they're actually really good watchdogs because they don't just go out and they just don't bark at the wind, that they are actually dogs that will bark when they feel like they need to alert you of something or they feel like there's some kind of trouble. So this means that they're really like, if you're looking for a great little watchdog that has a great history, it's kind of, it's a perfect dog for you. The dogs were also known that a lot of times they would, you know, join their masters, the llamas, that um, what's known as the koras, which is basically they walk um, clockwise around the sacred monuments. And so these dogs would follow along with the little, you know, the Tibetan llamas and others and would, you know, walk right next to them. They were actually involved in the everyday lives of the Tibetan lamas or the Buddhist monks. And there's a story told that they would sometimes use them as bed warmers. And actually, because these dogs were allowed within the monastery, that's probably very true that the Tibetan monks for many years would have these dogs would lie on their bed or they'd lie next to the bed. And that they would also be partly there as not just companion, but also as kind of a bed warmer. 
So here's an interesting part that the Buddhist monks prefer the Tibetan spaniels that are black or tan, and that they love to have a dog with a white chest because they believe the white on the chest means that it stands for a pure heart. And they also like the dogs with the white feet and, um, you know, or a white um, spot on the forehead because the white spot on the forehead is considered to be a Buddha mark. You know, the other dogs that a lot of other people have are the Lhasa Apsu and the Tibetan Terrier dogs. When I was doing some research about this blog I was writing about Tibetan dogs, I was quite surprised to see how many people were asking questions like, will a Tibetan Terrier be able to fight a bear? And here's an interesting part about the Lhasa Apsu and the Tibetan Terrier dogs. is In Tibet, they have what is called a... Um, snow leopard. And the Benton houses, a lot of times they have sort of like a flat uh, roof on them. So these sometimes the snow leopards will come onto the roof of the Tibetan house. And of course, if they fight like a Lasso Upsu or, or a Tibetan Terrier, a lot of times the Tibetan Terrier would win the fight. And if they won the fight, then the snow leopards will never return again to the home. And also, of course, many of the Tibetan Spaniels, because they want to protect their owners, will also come out to and try to join the fight. And since the Tibetan Spaniel is a smaller dog, I'm sure that many of them got killed within that fight with the snow leopard. But here's where it becomes the interesting part. So people are asking this question, could Tibetan Terriers be able to fight and to win for a bear? Maybe. I don't know. I have never actually seen one do it, but you know what? it might be something that they may be able to do because Tibetan dogs in general are extremely loyal and they're fierce and they will always seek to protect their families or protect their owners. And that's what makes them a great dog. But what's interesting about all of this with the Tibetan dogs is that these are dogs that are thousands of years old, but yet are relatively new in Europe and the United States when compared to a lot of other breeds of dogs. So if you're like me and you love dogs, this is really quite a fascinating history to know that there are these dogs that have been in the monasteries for thousands of years, but it wasn't really until the early 1900s that the dogs even count came out of Tibet when some monks gave them to some missionaries and others, and that they began to become known in Europe and in the United States. The interesting part about the Lhasa Upsu and the Tibetan Terriers is at the monastery, their name is pretty much of a name which is known to be the chain dog. And that's because the these dogs are actually dogs that maybe everyday people would have, um, which isn't quite exactly the same as the Tibetan Spaniel, which is really a dog that was for the llamas or for the monasteries. But they're both the Lhasa Upsu and the Tibetan Terrier are known as excellent watchdogs. And a lot of times in a lot of the monasteries, and especially in some of the remote, smaller monasteries, you might find these dogs will be chained outside the monastery and that they're not they're not being chained there because they're being cruel to them. Because actually Tibetans, if you know anything about Tibet, you know that the Tibetans worship animals and would do nothing to hurt any animal or to harm any animal in any way. And especially at the Tibetan monasteries, they have great reverence and respect for all kinds of animals, especially these Tibetan dogs. But the role of these dogs is known to be guard dogs. And they would, you know, attach them on both sides of the entrance of the monastery. And then as, you know, people come in and pass by these, you know, sort of bigger dogs will bark this thunderous, you know, loud voice and jump up and down and, and kind of warn people about, um, you know, if, if somebody's coming, they're trying to warn somebody against them coming. And the other part is like the, in many of the Tibetan monasteries, they actually depend upon these larger dogs as to be their protectors. They depend upon them as safety. It's kind of a little bit like their alarm system. These dogs are, they're, they're so well thought of that it's kind of like they have their alarm there. And again, because these dogs are so loyal to their masters, they will only bark when they know that there's danger or they'll bark for protection. And for many of the nuns or, or that are in the, the um, Buddhist nunneries, 
they will actually depend upon these dogs to be able to protect them against whatever hazards or dangers might come. Tibetans also like their guard dogs to be black or tan because they feel like these colors make their dogs more fierce looking and they will actually be able to ward them away from any type of intruder. And if the dogs have any spots above the eye, I, I really love this thought here because some of these dogs have like spots above the eyes. And they said they really like the spots above the eyes because it can make the dogs look awake even when they are actually asleep. The Tibetans believe that if their dog has a spot above the eye, that it gives their them four eyes too. So not only does it make them look like they're awake, but it also helps to, they believe it helps to protect them from any demons and that they can have these four eyes where they can see the demons that are coming, you know, into the monastery, into their homes. I think that's also really a great thought that, that a spot above a dog's eye can help ward off from demons. It, it's really quite interesting too what they feed the dogs. And um, the Tibetans have a food, which is called the uh, sampa, which basically it's like a ground mash of barley flour, and then it's mixed with the butter because they, you know, they make a lot of their own butter there. And then they will mix this together and they will feed this to the dogs. And sometimes they'll throw a bone in and the dog will have a bit of a bone or, or something else there to eat. You know, I, I never realized this, but my Tibetan Spaniels love butter. I know most dogs love butter, but they really love butter. And I thought, well, now this makes sense. Why? Because this is why what their ancestors have been eating for so many years would be this creamy sort of butter mixture of food. And in fact, if you ask the Tibetan monks, they'll say, don't feed your dog too much meat because the meat's not good for it, that they you know, should eat more vegetables and more of the barley and, and more of the butter, which is kind of interesting, which is very different from the way that we think about things in the West and how we think about our own animals in the West. I've always really loved this story of these Tibetan dogs, and this is one reason why I wanted to talk a little bit about this today, because it shows really how rich and how deep the history can be in so many of these other parts of the world. I think sometimes we forget that there are these places in the world where the where you know the history and the culture and you know where they've had the same breed of dogs for a thousand years. And it it really means that some of these cultures and other parts of the world are very, very rich cultures in the West should never underestimate that at all and how important this is for the tradition and the culture. When we traveled to Tibet those many years ago over those mountain roads into these small um, you know, villages where I'm sure very few foreigners had ever come, if, if any of them had ever come at all, and you go to these, you know, to these beautiful monasteries and it really was quite a scene. I, I will admit, I didn't see too many Tibetan dogs there. And we saw some dogs out on the street, but we didn't see that many Tibetan dogs within the monasteries because it seems like in some of the cities, maybe they don't have quite as many Tibetan dogs there as they maybe once did. But it is quite magical to go there to a place like Tibet and to be able to go into a monastery. And you, I remember steal some of the... Um, the monks that I don't know, if, I don't know what their name of them was, but they were kind of in training and they were, you know, down there on the grass and they were, you know, reading through their, their books and other things, just like you might find somebody at a um, university in America or at, or, or somebody else at a religious college where they might be down on the grass reading their scriptures or other things. It kind of reminded me a bit of that. And I thought about how in so many ways we maybe all seem so different, but in many ways we are all extremely similar. I really loved to be able to travel there and to meet the people and to see many of the people. We had a one of the men that we worked with there who was a principal of a very small school. The school probably had about 30 children in it. And it was just, you know, literally just a mountain village school. And I remember him talking about his son. And when his son was three years old, he had an infection. And because of the infection, he became deaf because there was no antibiotics in the village and there was no doctor 
to be able to help his son. So essentially, his son became death for something would not happen to um, children in a Western world because, of course, they'd go to a doctor, the doctor gave antibiotics, and they would you know, be able to fully recover from something that was so simple. But in a place like Tibet, up there in those mountains, it became something which became life-changing for this boy. And I remember him telling us about how proud he was of his son, even though his son was 16 or 17 years old, had never been able to get out of the first grade. But you could see the pride in his eyes as he showed us some of his pictures that his son was drawing of some of the Tibetan animals. And it really you know, brought home to me of how we may all think that we're so different, but in so many ways, we're all similar. You know, we, we maybe have a lot more similarities than what we think. You know, at the end of the day, if you're a dog lover like me, we all love our pets and our pets become part of our family. And this isn't that much different than many of these Tibetan monasteries where the monks have basically adopted these dogs and the, the, the monasteries where the dogs are in and have adopted them and they become part of the family. They become an important part of the family, whether it's as like the Tibetan Spaniels, where they're traditionally the companion dogs, or whether it's a Lhasa Apsu or the Tibetan Terriers and that they have become more of their guard dogs that they depend upon them. And I really thought about how we're actually very similar in so many ways that we sometimes want to make these differences become very great, like this person's so much different than me. But I really learned from when I went to Tibet and the people I met there that how we had so much more similarities. Yes, you know, these people were basically living a very, what we'd call consider to be a very rural and simple life. You know, they didn't have the iPhones, they um, you know, they had some internet, but not a whole lot of internet. They had some TV, but not a whole lot of TV. They were living basically a very simple life. And especially those monks that I met in the Buddhist monasteries were. But yet, at the same time, we had some things in common. We had some common things that we can understand each other. And I think that's a great lesson for all of us in life that we might go to another part of the world. We might think these people are very different from me. But really what we need to all do is we need to look and find common ground and find things that we have which are similar. And we should focus on our similarities and not on our differences. And that is what I believe is what it means to live your life as a global citizen. Focus on what you have in common with those who may be different than you, may speak a different language, be a different race, have a different culture, eat different food, find what you have in common, and live your life as a global citizen. We hope you've enjoyed this podcast. I know this is a little bit of a different one talking about dogs, but you know, dogs are one of my passions. So um, and I hope it's one of your passions, too. I hope that you are like me, that you enjoy and like animals. And if you've enjoyed it, you know, give us a thumbs up. We'd love to hear um, any comments or any thoughts you may have. And we hope that you'll consider subscribe to our podcast because we really would love to have you join and be part of our community and to um, live life as a global citizen. Also, if you have time, check out our blog, A Bus on a Dusty Road. We have a lot of other great information about all parts of the world because we love this big world that we live in. Thank you so much for listening.